destroyed until it's literally blown to smithereens. It's in, it's in piles of rubble all over. The British Army is living in a strip around the, the, the edge of the town, around the ramparts. But the centre of the town has gone. But it's more than just been destroyed, it actually physically has gone. Because if you read my grandfather's little diary, it says over and over again, into it collecting bricks for the gun lines. Because out there is basically a bog. Now beyond the beyond the walls of the town, we're at sea level or, or, or just thereabouts, and it's as foggy as anything. And it was drained by a network of dikes and ditches that ran all over it. But of course, the war has wiped those away, so it's completely waterlogged. So to get out there anywhere, you need to rebuild the roads and keep the roads rolled. So where are they getting the bricks from? They're coming into the town, just loading up with all the rubble from the town and taking it out out there. So the town literally disappears. There's a very famous bit of footage, which is an airship in 1918, right at the end of the war. Yeah. It's been on a documentary on, the, on Australian TV. Yeah. And it flew over the Western Front, basically filming it, but to, to record it, what it looked like. And it flies over Eve and it goes round and round Eve. And instead of seeing kind of a, a totally destroyed town, what you see are the big churches, the ruins of those, and then hulls. And what you're looking at are the, are the cellars, because they've removed all the rubble. It's already been, during the war it was being removed, by the end of the war it's just hulls. Um, so they're going to start this town literally all over again, almost from a, from a, you know, a, level, a level playing field. But one thing that is still here are these, the big churches. The reason being nearly all the churches have a crypt underneath. And those crypts were obviously going to be used as bomb-proof shelters. Why are they bomb-proof shelters? Because effectively that lot, if you look up, is going to come down on top of the crypt and, and protect it. So it builds itself a bomb-proof shelter. The cloth hall and the St. Martin's Church is so enormous that, that again, there's, you can actually see the tower, half the tower, the stubble tower is still there because it's also great, it's done, it's withstanding heavy artillery hits on it. Um, so it's, it's still there. But effectively, they all get destroyed. Why I stop here is because we do have a fragment of the original church. It's quite easy to spot, it's kind of grubby. So the, the archway here is still, and you can see where it's been patched up all over. But this little bit here, is, the, is part of the original church. How does it survive? Yeah, because that lot is on top of it. Um, and so it, it survived, buried underneath all of the all of the rubble. So it's just nice to see a kind of a fragment of the original town. And there are little fragments. When we go into the cloth hall, the whole the, the, the bottom at the bottom of the cloth hall, right at the bottom, where we're going to book in, that is fairly much original as well. It had to be built and be underpinned and they have to do a lot of work, but, but there's a lot of originality there. The other reason why we didn't take the rubble from these is there was always a hope that there would be something worth saving you know, in amongst the rubble. And in fact, they will use a lot of rubble and refront it, but they will use it for rebuilding these uh, uh, churches and, and big civic buildings. About uh, 1700s this was built. Prior to that, it was a castle, you know, a castellated uh, uh, wall right the way around it. When Vauban uh, was tasked to, uh, um, to build this in, in the uh, 1700s, He's using the latest technology, and the latest technology is about not having a castle wall. Can you imagine that's a castle wall? A cannonball, we're getting cannonballs now, and weapons of fire cannonballs, hits the outside. Doesn't look like it's doing lots of damage, but the shock waves are travelling through, and they're blowing up the back all the time. And, and, and it continues to until eventually a cannonball will start to go through. So it's a, a recognised kind of uh, effect. What Vauban has discovered that if you slightly angle the wall and if you build a soft bank behind it, then the shock waves do not travel right the way through. Yeah, so it's, it's a way that we even do modern tank armour works the same by having different layers of materials laminated together and shock waves cannot travel through different materials. You know, different materials. So it's, it's obviously still going to work. In, uh, in, in the First World War, when we've got high explosive shells on the other side, the same thing, the shock waves do not travel through. Now what Bob Ann did, this is the old powder store, he kept the powder stores here for the cannons that were on the top. What we basically do is reproduce what is here, he lives here, in an area not much further than where we are, because we're protected while we're tucked up against, against the bank. And these are in periods when the Germans are just kind of like half a kilometre outside the town, they are just almost in stone throwing distance outside the town at various times. So they get very, very, very close, but we still manage to hold on to it. So who are the people that are here? Well, they're the resupply people, the snowmen. What they're doing is as the infantry comes through on a night to go out there into the morass that's beyond where the physical fighting takes place, they load up with hand grenades, they load up with them with their bullets, they have their last foot, foot feed here, the field cookers are also set up here, and then off they go out into, uh, onto the battlefield. 
And where are they going to go? How are they going to get out on the battlefield? Well, most of them are going to go through where the Menin Gate is. So we'll talk about that later. But you, you have to imagine that this was an absolute hive of activity. <laughs> there was so much going on here. It was where they stored things. <coughs> uh, there's no civil population here. Excuse me. <coughs> the civil population has been removed. It was removed quite early in the war. It was ob always obviously too dangerous. So that's the next question. Why is it dangerous here? It's because outside of this town, all the way around kind of three quarters of it are ridges and the Germans are on the ridges for most of the war. So they can see exactly what's going on, on here so they can shell. I mean, nobody shells constantly. What they're looking for is movement, is a sign that there's lots of people there and then they will open fire with their long range guns and shell again. So just a quick by the by, how far are guns firing? Well, the smallest field gun, we talked about the one that had embedded that shell in the wall, that's three miles. So that's firing around about three miles. But we have guns going up to 30 miles. So there are, there are the big heavy guns are firing 30 miles. So they're a long way away. Um, there are guns at the end of the war firing on Paris from 80 miles away. So, so we get enormous guns by the end. By the end. Those guns have to allow for the rotation of the air when they fire um, because they're firing such a, such a the townspeople come back and almost immediately start rebuilding you think well how would they do that well there were plans there were photographs they knew what the houses were like and they wanted them back as they were and they were told straight away that who would be paying for this the germans would be paying for it so it's german german reparation money so get on with it you'll get your money back once it's it's going so lots of them did um, there's something else happening. Almost immediately as the war ends, and this town starts to be looking at to, to be rebuilt, first of all, what you've got are wooden huts here. These are the huts that the army were using um, prior in their, in, their, in their barracks, behind the lines. They're brought here for the townspeople. They're brought here for people. But, literally where we are, on the top of the ramparts here, great big hut, hutted hotels started. They were built on top of the ramparts. So who are these hotels for? Well, they were actually predominantly for women. Because literally in 1918, as the war finishes, and these documents are arriving on people's desks saying where the permanent burial spots of your relative is, and I will talk about those later on today. And this documentation would say for lots of them, it said uh, uh, he's going to be commemorated on the memorial to the missing, which will be built at so and so, so and so. Or it's a confirmation that they are still missing. So people, what they did was they, they got on the ferries, because we're now up straight away when the war finishes, became, becomes accessible to the public, open to the public. And women came in their thousands, literally in their thousands, and then their tens of thousands. And where are they coming to? Predominantly here. They're starting here, and they're going out on the battlefield looking for their for their relatives. Mm. Now, not necessarily doesn't mean they know they're dead. They're not looking for them. They're looking for their for their bodies with the vain hope that they might be here somehow, lost and confused. And there was a, always a hope for a lot of the families as they came here. Um, so this great kind of tranche of people arrives. The, the townspeople here are not stupid. They see this, and straight away you get a, a modicum of kind of tourism, uh, or as it was called, their pilgrimage, looking after pilgrims. And these these hooded kind of uh, hotels, and then as the town is rebuilt, we get proper proper hotels. In fact, I used to live in one just outside the far side of the gate, and it was a um, it's now apartments, but it was built as a hotel for the next tranche of people. So who's next? Who's going to come after the women? I think I mentioned it just briefly yesterday. It's the men themselves. Obviously, this is not applicable to Australia because it's too far, even though we know some Australians did come. And certainly Australians who are still working here in the rear areas came to the front lines again because there were people still working here until late 1919, clearing the battlefields, uh, uh, moving soldiers about who are still here. Because, of course, we're occupying uh, Germany. We're in the Rhineland occupying Germany, so they're coming back here to have a And again, we get lots of people coming back, lots of soldiers, some of them very, very in a very, very bad state of mind, uh, very traumatised, uh, post-traumatic, uh, as we'd now, uh, now call it, and they're living. Some of them are living rough, but they're they're all here. Where are they coming to? Well, they're coming to here. They're starting to come to this point. This is before the memorial is even, is even proposed. So there is a history starting in 1918 of people literally going to that far corner there and laying flowers. There were also buglers playing the last post here and there were things happening here. So let's now go to the actual physical commemoration. What's going to happen in 1918, the end of 1918, Winston Churchill and a, a big uh, group of uh, committee of MPs will approach the Belgian government and they will actually say, which is quite shocking really in some ways, we want to buy Ypres, the whole city. We want the whole city as a memorial to all of those that, that fought and died here. 
And the Belgian uh, people immediately, the Belgian government says, not a hook. Record. Yeah, exactly. On your bank. Uh, and I think that's the right, because remember that their whole policy is that they, they are looking to, um, to rebuild this in the way that the Germans, it's as if, now, now, now again, mm. as if the Germans were never here. They want to say, you came and destroyed half of our country, but it's as if you've never been, we put it back exactly as it was. And you can't do that if you're going to have a great big destroyed city in the middle of it. So it's turned down flat. The town then starts to be rebuilt and we start to get these people arriving. A lot of them are going to go and look at the cloth hall. So, and of course the cloth hall is in ruins and there's a lot of debate about what to do with the cloth hall, whether to rebuild it as it was, whether to rebuild it. But there's also that group of committee members again, Belgian government, plan B, would like your cloth hall. We want to keep it as a ruin in the middle of the town. By now, and it's amazing how quick it happens, this is 1919, these are going up. The, the town is reappearing. It's amazingly quick how quickly it reappears. The townspeople are here living in the hutted camps, but they're still here. They're rebuilding their houses. And they turn around and say, well, no, we don't want that because this is our city. The cloth hall is our civic headquarters. It's where the town hall is. It's where, where the, uh, uh, the uh, Bergemeister hangs out. We want it all put in back exactly as it was. So again, it's turned down. So the final rule of the dice is, and this is actually because people are looking, there are people laying those reeds here, there are people uh, here, is we'll have this. Now this is, I think this is by far the way of choice anyway. Because everybody that's going to serve here, like my grandfather, like anybody else who had a relative that served here, they go through this. Without a shadow of a doubt, at some stage, it's not an archway, it's just a gap. And it, by Australian soldiers, it was known as the gap. And they went out through there, onto the battlefield, whichever, wherever you were going, on the battlefield, you went out through this way. The entrance to the town where everybody's coming through is on the far side, you came through the town, and you went out through there. So to most people, uh, or the majority of people, if not all the people, it has a real resonance, and so it's a, it straight away strikes a chord. The Belgians are persuaded, and I would say there is, again, reluctance there is, uh, as to why do we want a big memorial in our town, we want it back as it was. But those are sort of any kind of commercial sense are thinking, hang on a minute, there's one hell of a lot of people coming to our town mm. you know, now. The buildings are already kind of uh, have been rebuilt. Because this won't be finished until 1927. Um, so they're actually, you know, there is a, a, a relevance to it that will, uh, will involve the prosperity of the town that you're looking at it from a kind of a mastery kind of way. And you have to. You know, the people here are, are, are trying to get their lives back on track again. Um, and I think I may have said yesterday, the interesting thing is that this was a backwater. Prior to the Great War, everybody that was going to see a medieval city, even though it was a very old city, they went to Bruges. They didn't come here, as they still do. You know, the Japanese and the, and the Koreans and the Oriental people that come here, especially they don't, they don't come here, they go, to, uh, they go to Bruges because it's a medieval city. This is a, this is a pretending medieval city but it's also now linked with the First World War. So there are now as many people in, in 1920, 19, you know, the 1920s and 30s, probably as many people are going to come here as, as go, to, go to Bruges because of the war. So there, is, there are opportunities. Those opportunities are still there. There are chocolate manufacturers here and chocolate shops here which make millions in a, in a year, millions. Uh, every school kid that comes here, when you see them get, coming off the coaches, comes with a crisp £20 note. They have pre-prepared bags of 10 or £20 worth of chocolates for you to take back. <laughs> no, they weigh a ton. You pick them up, they weigh a ton. They're just full. The kids go, oh, my. <coughs> no, and it's a uh, chocolate for every member of the family and, and they can eat half of it on the way home. No, uh, so they make a fortune as well as the people that come here to deliver this and buy really very specific chocolates which they, which they also make here. So, so the wealth of, the, of this town is actually starts to develop around the Great War. If you look at pictures in the 1920s, but the other thing you see here are women dressed in black, loads of them. They're the local women who have lost husbands uh, who are here. Normally what they're carrying are, are armfuls of bayonets and helmets. Because as we're clearing the battlefields, we are finding tons and tons of stuff everywhere. And it's been brought here and it's been sold to so the returning soldiers. All of those soldiers who couldn't carry souvenirs because they have to carry everything on their back are now coming back. And, before they, and especially Australians, we know they came back at that time, the ones that are still in the area, to buy those souvenirs to take back home that they've not been able to carry whilst they were physically doing the fighting. So they're coming back and buying them from the civilian population here. So there is very much a reason uh, uh, for this to be built. So this is eventually, uh, eventually going to be built, as I said, completed by 1927. The one thing that I always drive home with people straight away is this is not about the dead, even though it's going to be as well. If you read the inscription on it, to the armies of the British Empire who stood here from 1914 to 1918. Does that mention the dead at all? No. 
Does it mention people that are missing? No. That is about just about everybody. So if we were looking for a place to come to to commemorate uh, you know, Australian <laughs> effort or effort of people of the Empire during the First World War, this is the place to come um, to commemorate them. Whether they lived, died, whether you had a relative that even served in the war, this is the place for us to come to commemorate that, that service. And then the next line is a line that links it to what else this memorial is doing. And uh, uh, from 1914 to 1918, and to those of their dead who have no known grave. Mm. Because the second reason this memorial is here is to carry those names. And for Australia, it carries the names of every single Australian soldier who is missing in Belgium. He is, he is uh, on there. Now, we're going to be talking about missing at uh, quite, quite some length today. Because missing can mean different things to different people. Most people think it means you're out there you know, somewhere below to smith reeds. It does not. A large proportion of these guys are, are in cemeteries, but they are in cemeteries as unknown soldiers, so we don't know who they are. So, so there's a lot of the, of, the, of the missing that we'll see on that list. I will continue onwards unbroken apart from just one short period, uh, and that short period is fairly obvious, 1940 to 1944, um, and it's during the German occupation of, 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 this, uh, of this area. And even then we know from the, from the, uh, the buglers, they kept records. Occasionally they would go out into little cemeteries in the middle of nowhere and do, the, do our last post service there every, uh, every now and then. So, and they hid the silver bugles as well, so they were not discovered by the Germans during that period. It's also a little story that just is worth, worth, worth while telling. The Commonwealth War Grave Gardeners, who are looking after the, the hundreds, if not, uh, uh, of cemeteries within this area, um, they are predominantly uh, uh, Brits. Um, they're all soldiers who, are, who have uh, decided that the, ga the guys that were wandering around here aimlessly, they've actually eventually get jobs in the Commonwealth War Graves, they work for, for the gardeners, they marry, marry Belgian women, they have children. As the Second World War approaches, they have a choice, because their families are effectively Belgian, they're the only kind of the, 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 the English part of it, what do they do, or the British part of it, what do they do? Well, most of them go back to England to re-enlist, um, to join the, to be instructors in, in the army, but they left their families here. Their kids perceive themselves as kind of part British, part Belgian, but certain, certainly with an element of British. So they set up a little spying circle of the kids here. And they did minor sabotage, they unscrewed the bolts of the railway lines, they recorded troop movements, and through the resistance, they got information back to, back to England. There's a very good book called Children Against Hitler, and it's about the Commonwealth War Grave Gardeners' kids who remained here yeah, during, uh, right. during, uh, yeah. during the war. Yeah. So it's an interesting little back by yeah. this area, yet again, this whole area. But we needed to slow the Germans down because we were trying to evacuate from Dunkirk. So this was blown. So the Germans, as they came in, you imagine, from whistling down these roads, they didn't know whether it was going to be defended, so they opened fire on, on this. So these are bullet hits and damage to it. And in fact, the damage on this side is quite extensive. You see where the brickwork has been patched in? That's from the, uh, from the Second World War as well. Uh, I used to think it was from the First World War, but it's not. This was completely, the front of these, of, of these walls was so badly damaged, it all had to be refronted um, uh, from, the, uh, from the damage of the First World War. Because, of course, this is what the Germans are trying to get the shells into the Brits who were just tucked in, when I say Brits, I mean the Commonwealth, who were tucked in just on the, on the, on the front side. So yeah, so this was, this was uh, destroyed. Now there is some, some comment I need to make here about the Second World War, because we often wonder, uh, or historians have wondered for a long time, why didn't the Germans not destroy more of our monuments and things that were, were here, the, the cemeteries and stuff, and they don't, they don't really touch anything. Uh, there's very little that's going to be damaged in the, uh, in the Second World War that was commemorating from the First World War which is unusual because you can't say the same about the Belgians and the French with the German stuff. Wherever they built memorials during the First or Second World War, they are all pulled down. The French and, uh, and Belgians removed everything connected with the Germans being here. So you kind of think, well, this is an opportunity for the Germans to get their revenge, but they don't. So there was some belief for many years that Hitler had put out some dictate that said, you know, we want to not not be seen to be complete savages, so leave, the, leave all the, yeah, exactly. So leave all the, all the cemeteries alone. Um, over the years, we've gone through the German records of the Second World War and no, there was no such thing. Um, and in fact, there's no comment about it anywhere. We can't find any comment of the Germans saying, let's not touch the battlefield. We get to the infantry. Um, when you're trying to find a, 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 a family member, now somebody's got relatives on here, I can't remember who. Has anybody got relatives on, no. on the bending gate? No. So um, you, you look by battalion, if you know what battalion they were in. 
problem with uh, with water getting behind it and splitting them. It free in the winter it freezes, yes. it cr and it cracks the stonework. And so this stonework was forever having to be patched up and replaced. Very cleverly, what they've done: taken all the panels off, cut back the brickwork behind, put a semi-permeable membrane behind that, and then mount these on pegs. And then what they also don't do, they're no longer filling the gaps between with mortar, yeah, which again swells. So what it means now, the water still gets behind in the summer and in the winter when it freezes and, and the temperature alters that moves the stone, it doesn't do any damage anymore because... Uh, so we rode last night into here. We are now here looking out here. Yeah. Now for anybody that's been in the military, this is the most irritating thing known to man because it's not mapped to ground, which in other words, when we, uh, when I say going this way, you kind of all look that way. Yeah. It's not, it's that way. Yeah. So it's really blinking irritating. So this thing needs really rotating that way uh, and to be looking that way. But anyway, you get the gist. So this is where we're standing now. If you look that way, we're looking out up here, actually directly to Passchendaele. So Passchendaele is over there. Now in the day, um, even before total destruction, you could probably stand here and you could probably see Passchendaele Church because there wasn't a great deal in between. There was certainly no building just outside the gate here. This was farmland that started immediately outside the side of the town. So the fighting has been here from 1914. The Germans basically get stopped on these ridges eventually. The first battle of, uh, 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 of Ypres is a battle to try and hold these ridges. The second battle of Ypres is an attempt to hold the Germans as they, as they move, da move down. By the time we get to 3rd 1917, this is the line effectively that the Germans are holding. They're holding a line here, so quite close to the town, easy shelling, even the three, even the, the three guns firing three, uh, three uh, kilometres, three miles, can, um, can, can get into the town there. So, Third Eep is about getting the Germans off this salient, this is called the salient. This is that flat ground, when you hear about the First World War, in this area, you hear uh, 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 very often that the salient is the term they're using. It's actually a geographic term. It means a, flat, uh, it means a piece of land that's different, it's abutting another piece of land that goes around it. And in this case, it, it's, it's flat ground surrounded by, by ridges. Before this can start, we have the Battle of Messines. And the Battle of Mes Messines is going to be the fighting that will take, take in the June, will take this ridge. Absolutely superb fighting. Works admirably. 19 mines, boom, 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 all along that ridge, going to be blown. Those are the mines that are going to rattle windows in the Houses of Parliament in London when they go off. Largest man made explosions in the world at the, at the time. For those that have seen Beneath Hill 60, that's, that's where Hill 60 is. Hill 60 is the last one to be blown. It's this one, and that's where we're going next when we leave the town. We start here. Um, then we get the start of the Battle of, uh, of Third Eep which is that push to take this. And we needed that out the way before we could attack here. So that's why that's, that's taken place. And third, so we've got this. Yeah, we've got this now. Yeah. So our, our line here is there, yeah. and now we need to clear this. Um, what we're going to do is for Australian troops, this is going to involve the whole empire. Everybody is going to be here. But for Australian troops, they're going to come in at Hooge. They're going to be pushing up this road, and then they're going to hang a kind of a left, and they're going to come across these ridges here. So we get the fighting on the men in road. That's the first phase of the fighting. And these are all battle honours for Australia. Fighting of the men in road, we then get a series of woods of which polygon wood is probably the most important. Mm. Yeah. Then we get the Broodsin Ridge, which is straight on from uh, polygon wood, and eventually we get the last little bit where Australian troops are fighting in this area here of the Battle of, 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 of Passchendaele. And yet we call it all Passchendaele because something <coughs> is going to happen for this little tiny triangle at the top here, and that's the weather's going to change. And the weather becomes. This is all the way to last year. And prior to that, there had been something here, but it was like an insipid little stone on the ground that the said, Nepali campaign started, we've got fighting in Mesopotamia, and, we and that is actually organised from India. So hang on a minute, we've got the Indian soldiers here, we've got British soldiers. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bricks. Remember we saw where bricks are being made, so when we reinvented bricks, that's the size of brick and they've kept to it here. The Commonwealth War Graves, when they're looking at the size of brick for all of their monuments and all of their walls and everything, pick the same brick. So no matter where you see on the, around the Commonwealth, anywhere, where they're using brick, it's, it's the brick size from here, it's that smaller brick size. The other thing to see, and it's just with renovation, when you see houses being renovated here, Almost anywhere else in the world, they actually would you know, renovate and kind of uh, tidy up and take things out. They gut the houses here. They completely, utterly take out the inside of the house and start again. And I think it's an indication that the houses weren't actually built as good as we think they were built. That they were put up very quickly, as I said, in the early 1920s. 
and I don't think they're that well built. And so when they're going to renovate them, rather than just start tweaking and things, they nearly always just take out the inside. So they leave the facade up and then, and then completely rebuild. Fire, the German artillery that was uh, that was hitting us in this area. Uh, hence, a lot of artillery that buried in this uh, in this cemetery here. It's also interestingly is approximately the position that the Germans get to in uh, 1918 in their big spring offensive. Because we're going to be talking about 1917 and us pushing the Germans back off the ridges. Spring of 1918, we might as well not have bothered. The, the, they're back down here again. They retake everything in about three weeks. Uh, uh, to to eat. So the on the just beyond Hellfire Corner, this is where they get to as well. So this is Hellfire Corner roundabout. <laughs> That's a demarcation stone. You see the stone on the left hand side, little memorial with some poppy reeds beside it. Just on. That's called a demarcation stone. Position of the German advance in 1918. <coughs> it's a landscape that is devoid of anything. There's nothing here, no trees, no growth on the ground, there's no, there's no buildings, there is nothing. And in fact the town of Zillibeck, which is coming we're coming up to, 
was so destroyed that you couldn't actually find it. There was nothing there from the mud. Now, when I was a kid, I thought that was a reference to blood. It's not. It's a reference to powdered brick dust. It's the, it, it's the, 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 the houses were so pulverized that there's nothing left. See how it climbs uh, from, the, from here up to Hill 60. Anybody know why it's called Hill 60? chopped down in other areas of, of France and they're brought into Belgium or, or into, um, into into France itself. Problem, it comes in metric. We want it in Imperial, you know, because the French are cutting it for us. You know, they don't know what we want, it's just bits of old timber. So what we decide is it's time we did it ourselves. So what we do is we form the Forestry Corps. And the Forestry Corps is made up from guys that were sawmillers, that, 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 that were lumberjacks, that were uh, uh, quantity surveyors, they could look at the wood and see how much, uh, how much timber is going to come out of it. Transport men used to moving uh, uh, planks and beams around. Railway engines <coughs> for moving it up, up to where the lorries are. They're all there somewhere and slowly but surely they get taken out and end up doing the jobs that you, uh, that you had done. So it's, it's, it's as the war goes on we need more intelligent uh, uh, labour and, and we start to get it. And one little job that we probably don't think about, oh, the divisional train is literally it can be a steam train, but it can be a horse and cars, it can be a, like a wagon train, it's about moving things about. And again, out here, somewhere, there are, there are guys that used to drive steam trains. And, mm. and mm. eventually they'll take those guys, however many they need, and they put them in, and they end up driving trains here. Because we take over the real network behind us. Below that we have things like field ambulances, and uh, we should expect. But the most interesting one is right at the bottom, mobile veterinary sections. So what do you think the vets are looking after? What are horses. Yeah, that's the, uh, the main one is not horses. We talked, we may not talk about that, it's mules. Oh, the mules, major yeah. way of transporting stuff about, obviously the cavalry gallops around on horses, but generally speaking it's mules that are used for the mainstay of, of, of moving things around on the battlefield. But most people perceive it as a memorial to commemorate tunnelers full stop, even because each, each division had its own, uh, but this one is just for the first, but it's generally used to commemorate all Australian tunnelers. Uh, originally a wood as we see it now, um, and it's had a bit of a battering as you can see. Anybody like suggestions? Uh, you can see the spires of uh, of, uh, of Eve, um, and that's uh, so. If we were up on our on our ramparts waving to ourselves, you would actually be able to see us from here. Because what you have to remember is there's absolutely <coughs> nothing between us and and the ramparts. There in a second, it's from mining and it's from from underground detonations, including the Hill 60, the detonation of the of uh, the, the Hill 60 mine. Has, did, has everybody seen the film beneath again later? But it's just worthwhile uh, talking about. So imagine. We don't have to, we have to, we have to imagine it now, but it would be literally. There is a trench, or multiple trenches, going that way, they're going to the Alps. It's over 700 kilometres from, from, and it's a trench. You can get in it at the channel, and you can walk along it, who would want to, and you could come out at the Alps. No, it's, 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 it just doesn't alter. Now, effectively, that is the new border of Germany. And Germany's going to do anything to hang on to this new border, and eventually, if everything kind of goes well, they're going to attack from behind it and carry on with the push. But at the time when they're holding it steady, that one we are using one tactic to get them out of there, and that tactic is we are under tunneling, they're tunneling towards them, and we're going to make voids, and we're going to fill it with explosives, and we're going to detonate it beneath them all the time. So to stop it, what they are doing is you know, like a portcullis in a, in a castle that comes down with all those fingers to stop people getting into a castle. If you imagine a portcullis with about, about 200 metres or so between each finger of that portcullis running from the German frontline trench and it's running out in fingers like this all the way along the whole lot going slightly forward and at the end of each one, what is there? No. A man with a stethoscope. Yeah, listening. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. I've been to, I used to be in the Durand group which is a tunnel exploration team. And that man is at the bottom there with his stethoscope listening. What's he listening for? He's listening digging, digging. for people digging towards him. There's another bloke over there. And when they hear somebody, he takes a bearing. He takes a bearing. What do they do then? They send out a, a tunnel to intercept that tunnel coming towards them. What they try and do with that is get behind their tunnel, judging where it is. And then they're going to wait till they can hear the miners digging. They blow a camouflet, which will, <coughs> will destroy their shaft. 
They then wait for the rescue teams to come down and they blow a bigger one. The camouflage is like an underground explosion, which kills the rescue team and the original uh, original tunnelers. There was no, it was a no hold bars a bad battle underneath there. That is going on for the whole of the front line. So what you realise is this isn't half a dozen miners digging a tunnel. This is thousands and thousands of miners on both sides doing that work. And again, at the start, where are all the miners? They're in the flipping infantry. No, so they're having to get the miners out. In Australia, of course, there is a secondary thing. You've got a volunteer force. Miners weren't badly paid. No, uh, 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 Australian soldiers, six shillings a day. Does everybody know what a British soldier was getting? One. We've been getting one shilling a day since Napoleonic time. It shows there wasn't much inflation because the pay hadn't gone up. So one shilling a day is what a British soldier, soldier gets. Australian soldiers, six shillings a day. Miners, even more, because you've got to entice somebody from Australia to, to join the military. Yeah, loads joined for patriotic reasons. Equal number joined because it was better pay than what they were than what they were getting. And by God, you needed a bit of danger money if you were going to do mining here because it was really dangerous. I think the most interesting thing is the, is the different types of, there is really two different terrains on the Western Front for, for, uh, for us, for the Commonwealth forces. One is this here, which is clay. Uh, and clay is silent. When you're digging in clay, you are very quiet. So that's why when we watch the film Beneath Hill 60, they get right alongside each other sometimes because you can dig so quietly that you'd only realise you were close to them when you were nearly touching. You were almost touching. On the chalk, it resonates. So as you cut through chalk, you could you could hear it. We've done some trials. You can hear it for hundreds of metres. It echoes through the chalk. It just, it, almost like it's almost easier to hear than it is in the open um, with, with people. So you could judge where it was a, a lot easier. Um, but it was dry digging. You didn't need to pump 24/7. If you're tunneling here, it's 24/7 pumping. It floods the second you stop pumping. So you've got to you've got to pump all the time. Um, so very very different conditions. The guys that are digging in clay were known as clay kickers because they lay on their back on a, on a, a, a form sloping like that, feet up, cross piece on their shovel, pushed it into the clay, twisted, and you pulled out a plug of clay and you put it into a sandbag with several others, and then you passed it back. Who are they passing it back to? Infantry battalions. Infantry battalions were tasked to form a link of men from the, from the front to the surface. And, and, and those, when you go in those tunnels, your average tunnel is that. It's as wide as your elbows, going like that, and, it, and, it's, and it's just crouching. And they were just there, in rows like that, passing the... Oh. I can't think of anything worse, personally. <laughs> but uh, and I got down the tunnel. It just it beggars belief. You'd almost be willing to go into no man's land for a break, <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. You would. I just, just imagine, if you really were truly claustrophobic. Oh. You know, and there must have been guys that were claustrophobic. You know. uh, and I don't know. I don't know what happened, because you, would, you had to obey orders. They'd so. get shot for... No, they'd get shot for... We don't put anything permanent in there, basically. It's interesting, when they explore the tunnels, you actually find them. You can see little scoops in the side, of the, of, especially the chalk, and you can be low, and you can, the, the rats eat the candles. But what you can see is, you can see where the candle was, there's, there's a bit of wax kind of running down, and above it you can see the black mark, where, where the candles were put in. They actually had a, a very good, they, they used to put steel uh, pipes in for, for oxygen, because you had to keep a flow of oxygen no, going. Yeah. They used two things, they used actually a hand pump, but they tended to squeak. So what they are, and of course the Germans were listening all the time if they could hear anything. And so what they tend to do is look round in the rear areas for where blacksmith shops were. And they'd get the great big bellows, and they'd use big bellows. Yeah, they were made less. Top of the ridge where forced off it, it never really leaves the actual ridge, the fighting. But for the, for the detonation, uh, um, for the Battle of Messines, we are basically a couple of hundred metres that way. Just literally down there, just off the, just off the lip of the, uh, of the hill. We actually have trenches that come forward and they get a bit closer because they follow the railway cutting. Because what's going on over here is they're putting in a new railway bridge uh, here over, over the railway. Right, and that zone red ran on the whole of the length from the, uh, from the channel to the Alps and it was about 30 miles wide. Um, that's not all of where the fighting went, but that's where the main fighting went in a 30 mile wide strip. That would become parkland and it would become an area that people would ever live. And there was a reason for that. They didn't know what the ramifications were of, of the amount of high explosive that had been poured into the ground. But more than that is the gas. They didn't know what the long-term effect would be on crops and things, because it was a little bit like nuclear, nuclear bombs. You know, we didn't know what the long-term effect on, on the landscape would be from that. And so there was a worry that, that men would never be able to live on the battlefield uh, areas again. And so they called it Zone Red. The French sealed it off um, from their population. They didn't tell us what they were going to do. I know it sounds bizarre, but it wasn't made clear to us what was happening. And so at, at the end of the war, as we're then pushing the Germans back, coming in right behind us all the time, are the actual the, the, the farmers. 
and they took the land straight away and started work on it. So it, so it became kind of it would have been political suicide for the French to then say, oh, by the way, did we not mention get off? You know, you can't have your land back. Um, and so, so it was it, it, in our areas that we held. There is very little left. And Vimy Ridge tomorrow, when we cross it, is one of one of the uh, the largest uh, preserved, preserved sectors. Amatol. Now, if you try and, and, and vision uh, visualize what that is, it's about forty five thousand bags of sugar. So forty five thousand bags of sugar are not going to fit in there. You know, it's an enormous volume of uh, of explosive. One that they create in enormous great room. So the so the tunnel might be big, but what is going to be created at the end of that tunnel is a bloody great room that they're going to fill full of explosives. And for those that have seen and remember beneath Hill 60, at this right at the start, they're kind of trying to walk around it because it's it's in boxes and it's stacked up in this room uh, uh, that's un under uh, under the ground. Here. So I'm just going to talk just quickly about this before we're going to have a look. These tunnels were dug almost a year before we detonated them at the start of the Battle of the Sea. And that was a clever ploy. We managed to get them in without the Germans knowing we were there, and then went all quiet. And so the Germans, if they'd heard any noise, they kind of tried, tried to camp the tunnel and missed it completely. So they were all there just sitting, waiting for the right time. We did something even cleverer. Just before we attacked, we made the Germans n aware that we were going to attack. And what did they do? They moved up all the reserves into their front line trenches <laughs> and then we detonated them. So we killed double the amount of Germans when we detonated. So it worked very well. It was an a, a, a ex exceedingly successful uh, operation. Now, just to put the more gruesome side of that into perspective, when we walk here and we're walking on this wearing out soil, there are fragments of both people and stuff everywhere in this soil. You see it all the time. When you, if you know what you're look, looking for, I'll point some out in a little while. Hopefully not fragments of people, but you do find uh, teeth is one of the things you find in the, in the, in the soil. Because bones slowly dissolve, and, 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 but teeth do not. And so you do find teeth on a regular basis on the, on the back of it. So it, it, you, have, you kind of forget, don't you, sometimes when you're in these sites, that, that actually this is where, where we killed each other. And, this, and a lot of the guys that were killed here are still here, sadly. So we're going to you know it's a German blockhouse. No. Yeah, where it is, that would be a clue, yeah, but there's something else. You're looking at it. <coughs> the door. The door always faces your own lines. You would never have your door oh, facing no. the enemy because you get shells coming <coughs> in it. So it's always a straight way, straight away you can tell whose blockhouse it is because it faces your own lines. So this is a German blockhouse. This is what we're trying to get rid of on top of the lip of this crater, of the, 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 this ridge. Um, there would have been a line of them running right, right the way along. Two reasons why they're building up here. One, because you get a great view. Second thing is, if you're using height, you don't have those issues with flooding that you have if you're uh, if you're anywhere off these ridges. So you can actually build them into the ridges. These are what I describe as hull down bunkers. They're dug into the landscape to keep to keep them so they're not quite so obvious. Um, they're roughly built. You can always tell the further back you get behind the lines, you get much better uh, graded uh, uh, concrete. When you're up near the uh, near the front line, you can imagine these are guys with bucketfuls of cement and picking up stones in the area and mixing something and throwing in any bits of old steel they can find to give you a blockhouse. Now I know why you're going around the front here because you're saying, how the hell do you fire your gun then? If a... In the main, and I have to say in the main, First World War blockhouses are not for fighting from within. They are purely shelters, because your job is to come out when the shelling moves off you, when the enemy's attacking, your job is to come out and to set your gun up somewhere like this. There will be pre-prepared positions, whether they were going to be there or not, after the shelling was another matter, but you would set something up close by. But you would, this is where, so these were predominantly for machine gunners. So the next thing to look at, this is the, this is the parameters of the blockhouse. This has got between three and four foot thick walls. How much space is there in the middle of this blockhouse? Four foot. It's kind of like this. And this would be for at least three, or probably four men with a machine gun in the middle of them. So they then go out and they keep the doors. They would have steel plates inside to put across the door. You keep it as secure as you can. The one thing that's missing from this, any bit that was above ground will be covered in sandbags. There's a reason for that. If this is hit by a heavy shell, even without penetrating it, the shockwaves will kill you inside, ruptures all your tail and all the tail organs. So very often you'd find guys in these that were dead but with no obvious signs uh, uh, on them. So the guys are going to come out when the fighting starts, they're going to set up their guns around here. Who do you think is going to move in here when they come out? Because somebody will move into here. Ready, I go. 
it, signalers. It, it, it could possibly be signalers. That is actually one option. It would be runners because <coughs> because yeah. So the methods of signalling. Let's just think about the methods of signalling. First of all, what are they trained for? You're absolutely right. They are trained for for, sem for semaphore. Would you stand here? <laughs> 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 Not really. So, but they were trained for semaphore. They're also trained for um, for Morse, but that's telephone cable. That's also cut. So what they're mainly trained for is a bit of paper and and I'm running that running fast. back. <laughs> so that is a potential, but that, but it wasn't the one I was actually thinking of. Who else would come into here? Every so soldiers feel much more confident when they know. Oh, the ambos. Yeah, medic medical mm. medical teams. So medical teams would be going, uh, going to hear. Possibly not a doctor as the war goes on. I'm talking from a British perspective here or a, or a Commonwealth perspective. Doctors, generally speaking, were kept further back. At the start of the war, they were very near the front line or, or in the front line with the infantry, but they died as readily as the infantry and we were losing too many doctors yeah. um, who were properly trained doctors. So they were moved further back. It's much more likely to be a bloke that's quite capable of whacking on a bandage, um, splinting, and uh, and generally stabilising. But that that's that's about all. So that's it. We're on the we're on the lip of it now. Now this is not by any means the best defined crater um, uh, of those that were blown. <coughs> okay, so these are all more shelling holes, and on that far side there was a railway cutting. So the whole of that side went into the railway cutting. But but the synchronisation of watches was a bit iffy, yeah, yeah. And, and so everybody was a bit nervous. So they all waited for the uh, for the one beside them to go, and it was due to start from the one on the right. This is the one on the extreme left, looking at it from a, yeah. our perspective. And so this actually rippled, it went along, and I find that actually just even worse. So if you imagine you're a German on this position, somewhere here, and you can see this, it, it was called pillars of fire because they looked like big pillars of fire. And he would have heard and felt and seen this thing running towards him, and he'd be thinking, is this on me? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Is this under me? Am I on the next one? I mean, because there were big gaps in between. It wasn't constant. You know, there are. In fact, there are there are kind of quarter of a mile between some of the gaps. So, but you didn't know that. You know, so you did, you wouldn't know where the next one. And that's going nine to on the one hill. Yeah, it's it's one ridge. Anyway, we actually have the ridges that run round the salient. So we're, this is, and that's why it's so important. This is that linking point between the Messines Ridge and the salient. So hill sixty head. One mine, this is one, it underneath it. Yeah. 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 And they've they've almost rounded it off. Um, this one will be captured in, in that uh, in that offensive at, uh, the, during the machines fighting. <coughs> Unusually, here we will do something unusual. We very often what's called reverse these these blockhouses. Now reversing meant we didn't turn them around, obviously. What we did was where the door was, because the door now remember is facing the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, we we built piles of sandbags in front of it to give it so that the shells couldn't come straight into your captured blockhouse. <laughs> Here they've done something different. They decided it was in such a good place and such such ideal for setting up machine guns that they would cut slots through the solid concrete to make it so that it could be used for a British machine gun position. Now that's quite unusual for this this time of uh, uh, of the war, 1917. Um, sadly, it's not going to remain British for very long. It's going to be re retaken in that German Spring Offensive in 1918, and this will become again German held. But that's not the end of the story because it's from this position in 1940 that the Royal Scots Fusiliers in the May will ask for volunteers from a company to stay here and fight to the end, basically. And that's what they did. They fought here until they were all killed and they, they gained half a day. Uh, and half a day at this point was absolutely crucial for the evacuation of the troops at Dunkirk. So that's why we lose the memorial over there. That's why the uh, tunneling memorial is damaged is because the physical fighting is going on exactly where we're standing here, tied into this, this block. So it's amazing, isn't we'll it? We'll go and have, have a look at the block. The important thing is we can see that the uh, the concrete, how thick it is. Yeah. We can also see that the concrete is slightly better graded oh, here. Way. Now it's better graded here because we are that fragment further further back off the. It only needs that much, but it means that people build the. You know, you'd have been crawling about trying to build this that one. So this one again will be uh, the they're using as you can see an awful lot of re, uh, steel reinforcing. The further back you go, you start to see. Um, so the damage to this, some of it is Second World War. Uh, they um, the thing that's missing from this, is, and it's not quite so obvious, is the fact that what we once had here was an awful lot of timber inside these. Anybody know why you'd have timber? Seals from, from the gas as well. We actually had built what were called gas curtains, which were... Um, just really ...being created, and it's like a ship rising up a, a wave. As a, as a crater was formed, it went oh, to that. Sorry. These guys like it had it, they would not survive that kind of blast by the landscape. Yeah, That 
now to see you're standing in the middle of the crater of the uh, Beneath Hill 60 mine. Um, it's not as well defined as some, it's not as deep as some, and that's partly due to the material that was here. If you imagine on the sod we've got chalk and it's a bit like a pressure cooker, and when it blew there it went <laughs> and it really blew out and it didn't, a lot of it didn't come back into where it went. Here it's a bit more uh, glutinous, it's going to go bang, it's going to go up and then a lot of it's going to drop straight back down where it, where it came. It'll still do exactly what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't create the, the enormous crater. Then what was left on the, on, the, on, the, on the lips was blown in by subsequent fighting that, that is going to slowly again to, so, to soften the outline. One of the interesting things to remember when you detonated one of these and you did that bang, you are creating more height. The amount of soil is piled on the sides. That's why if you've detonated one of these you have to capture it. Because if the Germans can capture it before we can get there, they suddenly have a base of everything. That fraction of extra height with a machine gun on top Suddenly you can pump bullets down into sections of the trench and you can see into bits where there are soldiers and you've suddenly got a much better field of fire. So it's equally as important when, when these detonate that you take them and the Germans do not. Now again, that's why this battle was so successful. The Germans did take it. Uh, the, sorry, the, the Allies did take it. The Battle of the Sea was, was eminently su uh, su uh, successful. Of great success, and it's as I said, if you want to read about the Battle of Messines, there is only really one book. It's called Pillars of Fire, um, because as Anglo-Saxons, we have a terrible trait: we don't write about success. We, uh, we like a damn good disaster. So, so Dunkirk, uh, um, the Passchendaele, Gallipoli. Um, Gallipoli. We love a good old disaster. We write loads of books about it, but we do not, generally speaking, write about success. Success is just taken for granted. It is, the, as the name implies, it's a Commonwealth war yeah. So, so you get all, na uh, all nations of the Commonwealth within that within that cemetery. What you did, as far as your private uh, uh, commemorations for missing, was really up to you. Um, and, and so, committee sat and said to the to the Commonwealth war graves, actually, we'd like to have the, the memorial to our, to our missing, to, you know, put on this memorial, or we'd like to build our own, or whatever. Of course, building your own meant you funded it. The, the governments funded the building of the actual uh, memorials. They're then looked after by the Commonwealth War Graves. So you see what you mean about the erosion? Yeah, it is. It's, it's literally what's the most... Way Sixty-two. Yeah. Uh, the division was very good at self-promoting, so it put a bit memorials to itself all over. And 1917. And cabins and holiday homes and all sorts. So it's it's now an area of uh, of 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 where the Belgians come to kind of relax. So it always feels slightly odd to do that. So this is Glencorse Wood coming up, again taken by Australian troops fighting up here heading towards the September. So there's nothing here at all now still? No, nothing military at all, no. And, and not even anything in the woods like we have in France where we can walk into the woods and we can go and see the re re remains of trenches, nothing here. There were an awful lot of block, big concrete blockhouses here, but in most cases the Belgians got rid of them. They blew, they blew them up. And actually it was a, cl a clever way of clearing the battlefield of all of the battlefield munitions. They'd pack them inside the bunkers yeah. and then get rid of two things at once. If you do something utterly bizarre, then they're not going to go off. Not by kicking them, picking them up, plough hitting them, it's not going to go off. It's not good. No, or a man with a hammer and chisel trying to take off the, the nose cap. That was in Pakistan earlier. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, these were Ru Romanian. No? It's, uh, you'll see some in front and then on the right hand side. It's a beautiful Scottish soldier, burning out, advancing in bronze, advancing on the Germans. Fantastic memorial, brand new, only been up uh, three months. Um, and um, it's from the fighting here in 1915 as we're trying to hold these ridges. The Australians will fight in exactly the same place in 1917 in the, on the 26th of uh, September, fighting in Polygon Wood, and they will have an atrocity uh, committed against them on, the, uh, on Blackwatch Corner. And that's that the Germans here pretended to surrender, and the Australians came into the open to take the several bunkers, uh, it was actually a collection of bunkers, take the surrender of those bunkers, and hidden machine guns opened upon them. The um, Scottish soldier is just here on the right hand side where the flags are. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. A gush. So that, that literally appeared two months ago. 
Fantastic. So it's one of the best memorials there in recent years that's been put. I mean, that, happened, that. <laughs> that was clever. How did I do that? And honestly, we don't win. Gee, polygon wood, it's thick, isn't it? Yep, been uh, like all the woods back on exactly as it was. It was always a wood that was uh, uh, had been created for for the production of timber. So it's still it still is. It's working wood. <coughs> like a lot of the woods here, they're not done as as you would kind of perceive, where you clear a wood of all of its trees and then you replant it here. Um, Here it's where you actually you take a few trees down, then replant a few, put a few more in, so the woods always remain. Dressing posts. You have uh, field uh, uh, field ambulances. You have uh, then the hospitals themselves. Um, then you have concentration cemeteries. That's where they decide that they're going to actually put everybody after the war, and they're going to create a, cem uh, a cemetery. What they'll all have, all of the cemeteries, no matter what type of cemetery you're looking at, they all have what you're sitting beneath, which is a cross of sacrifice. Now, a cross of so that's the first thing they'll have. The second thing that they'll all have is um, a stone of remembrance. So the bigger ones have a stone of remembrance. This one actually has a stone of remembrance. It's got a sword on both sides. So I'll just go back to the cross of sacrifice. The cross of sacrifice to me looks rather Christian because it looks like a cross. So even though they say it's non-denominational, I always think, I'm not sure. But if you wanted a bit of a reinforcing of that, you'd know that that sword that's on there is actually called, in heraldic terms, it's a crusader sword. So if that's non-denominational, it's a bit odd that it looks like a Christian cross and then somebody's bolted a crusader sword to it. So anyway, but it is supposed to be non-denominational. All the cemeteries are going to be designed, so that's the next thing to say. We kind of imagine that they just develop themselves, but they don't. There are the eminent architects of the time, they sit down and they draw these cemeteries and decide where they're going to go and what they're going to look like. And it was, it was a fairly prestigious uh, uh, job to get, was designing the cemeteries. And we get some of the best architects of the time, Lutyens, who will design the Australian National Memorial and also the British Memorial to the Missing, both of which we'll see in the next few days. Um, he's one of the designers, uh, a chap called uh, uh, Baker, he's another. There's a whole heap of them. They are the cutting-edge uh, architects of the, of, the, of the time. So what are we, why have we, we stopped here? We've stopped here because We've got both types of cemeteries in this in this one site. This cemetery down here, who's going to guess what type of cemetery that is? Battlefield Cemetery, it is. So all of the soldiers here are going to be in their one and only resting place. They were brought here from literally on the surface, lying where, wherever they were killed, brought here, probably buried by their comrades or burial teams, clearing the battlefield at the time, and they're going to be buried where, where, where they're in the nearest cemetery. What you can see from looking at it is, and that's the clue, is it's random, it's all over the place. It's not the nice neat rows that we're used to seeing, and which we'll see in two minutes. Um, this is very much as groups of men came in and just buried them. Now it's quite unusual, because normally, even with battlefield cemeteries, when they're starting to sort them out and reorganise them, they very often exhume everybody to put them in the nice neat rows. Um, so it's unusual to see them still as they were originally buried. These guys have not been touched, and the cemetery has been designed around them, rather than anything else. So the question is, why was this cemetery here? Well, it was here because in 1915, just beyond it, was a German cemetery. And this is very common for us both to use the same cemetery. So what we did was we buried our dead alongside the German dead. <coughs> so if that's the case, where are they? Well, they've been moved. They were actually moved in 1957. Because in 1957, post Second World War, the Belgian government had had enough of Germany, to say the least. And they said, we don't want Germany anywhere. And if we're going to have Germans, we want them all in one place or centralising very, very big cemeteries. And so this cemetery was actually shut down. 
We can now even see where it was. If you look, um, for those that sitting here, if you look at the wall exactly opposite this entrance, where we go into here, on that back wall on the right hand side, you can see a straight line in the brick in the stonework where it once went through into the uh, into the German cemetery. It in the form that we now see them when we go to a German cemetery, 1957, that's the last time they're fiddled with, so that's what, what, they're, what they're going to look like. We will see a German cemetery tomorrow. Um, so, this cemetery, Battlefield Cemetery, soldiers buried randomly, all buried in, in the September round there, and predominantly, no Australians here actually, they're, they're nearly all New Zealanders. There's no need to go in the cemetery here, we're going to move in and go and have a good look in the other one, because I want to then talk about the end up getting somebody who is, a, who will eventually, a group of people who eventually will become the Imperial War Graves. Prior to that, there were grave registrations units. Before that, it was the Red Cross. So how does that come about? Well, actually, it's very simple. Prior to the Great War, regiments buried their own dead. Wherever they fought, they buried their dead, they recorded them, and they organised the payments of the families and pensions because they were regimentally paid uh, from, uh, from a pot. First of all, it's the government that's going to pay, but who is checking where everybody's buried? Who is kind of keeping the master list of where everybody's buried? And the simple answer was, in early 1914, as the war starts, nobody was. And suddenly there's a, a realisation that you know, this war may go on a long time and we need to have a, plans in place for what's going to happen in the future. And it's a chap called uh, Ware who is going to kind of bring it to the attention of the, the military. He's actually running a Red Cross ambulance unit in France. And same old story, isn't it? If you could mention to people, uh, what, what, you know, what are we doing about this? And I think we ought to be doing this. And the answer to him was, well, since you've suggested it, you're going to be doing it. So he eventually will be knighted for his, uh, for his efforts at uh, 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 really recording where people are and, uh, uh, and creating these war groups. Um, it's going to be uh, to, to preserve the memory of all of, all of these, uh, these guys. The landscape is utterly, utterly devastated here. It's been fought over since 1915 to, to, to 1917 when the fighting comes up here, 26th of September. And it, you're fighting in a landscape that is devastated. It's, it's shell holes, created, destroys woods. We're going to talk about the fighting in the wood, but in, again, in reality, there is no wood. It, it's, it's odd branches and twigs. But you'll see a picture of it in a second. When we go to the Australian National Memorial at Villas Bretonneux, not on there. It's not on there. Um, it's because it was kept quiet. Um, and it's kept quiet for the very same reason that if they could dig down here, it still floods. So if you dig into the side of a hill, then, then especially a man-made hill, then you're laughing. So that in the dry, they could hollow it out and create a big, a big concrete position. Um, if you look to your, to your uh, right or left, down onto the cemetery, immediately we can see this is a concentration cemetery. How can we see that? Well, very obviously there is symmetry in the cemetery. That is the uh, Stone of Remembrance down there directly in front of us. And the thing in the, in the, in the, the back, as f f opposite us, that is the New Zealand Memorial to the Missing. But it's so, uh, remember we said that yeah. they commemorate, yeah. it, it, on each of their battlefields they commemorate their missing, they're commemorating their missing here. It's also doing something else, it's, it's a very practical walk. Well, if it was a horrible wet day, you want somewhere where you can actually eat your sandwiches in, uh, in peace in, in the dry. So that's its practicalities. It's somewhere where it was dry on a, on a wet day. Um, the biggest thing that you're going to notice when you go here, or even looking from here, it's a bit hard to tell, especially if you're not quite sure what you're looking for, but the majority of the soldiers here are actually unknown soldiers. They're known by their regiments, and they're known by their, their for Australians, they're known by their, their country, their commonwealth. Um, but it's, uh, it's, there are by far more guys. There's some of these guys, obviously these are all killed in 1917. They've been in the ground 18 months before they're going to be exhumed, some two years. Um, and you're lucky if you can get a name. Uh, but if they've got a cross above which names them, then you're fine. But the majority of these have been buried in little groupings where there isn't a cross above them. It's just a group of decision by Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling very much involved in this commemorative kind of operation with, with the Commonwealth. Daniel Radcliffe was uh, was yeah, Kipling's so son. Yeah, um, he was called uh, Jack, but uh, his proper name was John, but everybody called him Jack. He um, uh, he was pulling strings, and the, the strings went that high that he was a king. Um, um, and the king also had a complex about the fact that he pulled strings together.
So the question would be, and we, and we, we, we don't ever know, why on earth would she use that as, a, as, a, as his epitaph? I think it's showing that she was she wasn't all right, that everything was not all right, and he knew. You know, but he's trying to trying to reassure his mother right to the end, the, the withdrawal, and the spent rounds. We talked about the distance of bullets firing three miles, not even aimed at them. Scott's helmet's on the floor. It ricochets off his own helmet, and it goes through his neck, and it goes through the head of the British officer, and it killed them both. Um, what records? It says vindictive. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they did. They, they felt that if they fought against Australians, if they held any kind of grudge, they were in trouble because they held grudges. You know? So I think it's just interesting. Vindictive. Um, so we're, we're, uh, this is the storyteller of this story. Um, these are. Uh, uh, five guys who were actually found at, at the side of a road when they were uh, uh, putting a pipeline in. Um, Matt McLaughlin was over here doing a documentary for ABC or whoever it was, I'm not sure who it was, but he was doing a documentary anyway. And I would say, I think it was going fairly boringly. They weren't, they was working with an archaeological team, they weren't finding anything. S at the same time, a guy that owns a cafe down the road has just been, who's an amateur archaeologist, was just told they found some guys in a, in a roadworks. So he went down to go and have a look and realised that, 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 that it were Australian soldiers and there weren't just one or two, there was a potential for more of them. And, and bizarrely, they were actually right underneath the road. They went under the road um, when they started. They went very deep, but they were, they, they were right underneath the road. So the road was built on top of them. So they had to shut the road, take the surface of the road off. What that led to is uh, to a few bizarre things happening. And this, this one, uh, these two guys here were in a ridiculous state of preservation. Um, one of them, especially here, uh, Hunter, he'd been uh, buried very carefully with a, an extra gram sheet put over him and he'd been tucked in so you could see that some care, he was laid out properly, some care had been taken. These were battlefield burials but there'd been some care in his burial. That's the first start of the story. The second part is where they were actually buried was where there was once an Australian cemetery. But you can imagine that when they're, that when they're gathering these guys here to bring them into places like this, They'll go to where there used to be a cemetery, or there was lots of crosses, but people are not where they're supposed to be, they can't find anybody. So this is the first thing you need to know about the Commonwealth War Graves. They, their, their job is not to physically go looking for, for bodies. Their job is to recover bodies who are marked with a cross, or where there's physically a, a body part there that they can recover. They do not go randomly digging holes. So once they've cleared the cemetery, they realise there were 12 men who were not there. They were there somewhere, but they weren't marked, so they couldn't find them. Anyway, so here we are, 90 years later. The pipeline is, is, is going through where the cemetery used to be, and, and there they find the, these, uh, these five. So they have a list to go by. They already have a list of who's missing from that, that cemetery. One of them is a chap called Hunter, who they also have a record of when they go to the war memorial, that he was buried by his brother, because his brother left the... Um, and you have to remember, there, there are, there are mm. archivists and people, who are researchers who are doing this. They discover that he was buried by his brother um, and uh, at the time. And this guy immediately fits the bill because he looks like more care had been taken of his burial. I've seen the photos of his exhumation, in fact, to Johan shows them, and you see a little bit on the, uh, on the actual uh, film. No, actually, no, you don't see any, anything on the film, thinking about it. Uh, but his state of preservation was, was utterly bizarre. He was nearly mummified rather than rather because the road had gone over him stopped the water running through so oxygen hadn't been going so much down and so he was he was kind of mummified very bizarre and um, it, it, there was an imprint of his face on the on the ground of the cloth that went over his face the, the ground shape it was it was very very peculiar anyway um, so uh, he's uh, he's identified very quickly family they managed to uh, put adverts in the newspapers family see it and think hang on a minute Sure, we've got a relative called that. Looked in the family Bible, found him, submitted DNA because this is one of the earlier DNA uh, profiles, and they eventually get them these two very quickly. By and it explains all of this in the, in the film. These two very quickly, this one a few months later, and those two never because, of course, DNA only works if somebody comes forward with, with DNA, uh, and, and nobody ever did on, on those two. It may be that they've got no relatives that, that survive, it may be that the relatives emigrated, or who knows. Maybe that they just didn't see the advert for people that from the, from the areas where they thought they were from. But um, yeah, so this is recent. This is only uh, in I think it says 90 years ago. It was I think. so. It's nearly, so it's nearly nearly 10 years ago when the uh, eight years ago when they, when they found them.
Zonibek. I want you to remember what Zonibek actually looks like because I'm going to be showing you a picture of it uh, during the uh, the war in a minute. Uh, the Broodsin Ridge, we're now climbing up, very much uh, yet another phase of the Australian fighting here. Apart from the fact the car went straight on and hit it, and now the fish head is fallen off. <laughs> so the brutes turn into the Passchendaele Ridge when we, we turn the corner. So this is the Battle of uh, Brutesin, but it becomes the Battle of Passchendaele as we turn the corner, and I'll point all that, that out when we get off the coach in a minute. So we're right on the highest points. Looking that way, we look all the way back to Eve. Looking that way, you're looking across German territory. This is right on top of the ridge. Now, from being uh, a quiet cemetery, this will be an enormous scrum when we get here. Uh, it's always very, very popular. So this is Passchendaele there. That's Passchendaele in front. That's oh, Passchendaele yeah. Church right in front of us. Um, so this is this is an old traditional British way of uh, of building that they've uh, they've copied here. Um, good flint nappers can get striped bandings in the walls. So if you have a look there, you can see you've got darker sections at, yeah. the, at the bottom. This is all natural, not natural from this area, bizarrely. It's natural from chalk uh, chalk uh, land. So when we go back on the on the uh, on the Somme, you'll see. Just look that way, you get a really good view. And what, what are you looking at? You're, you're actually looking at the Passchendaele battlefield. Do you remember when I was showing you that, that uh, uh, this morning? We're looking at the uh, Ross Bastion's bronze, and I said, All this bit up, this bit, this bit, this bit is all the third battle of Ypres. And then this little triangle at the top is, is Passchendaele. This is the triangle. There's the church, spire over there. That's Passchendaele Church. This wall is here deliberately. It takes you across the Gravenstaffel Ridge, which is where we're also attacking up. And so basically, Gravelstaffen Ridge points directly up to, the, up yeah. to the, the, the village itself. So all of this, just this sweep of land to the high ground, and just like the over it, is a battle of Passchendaele. That's all, all it is. It's that the last little bit. Yeah. What we've got here is, um, it's about memory, this, this whole section in the middle here. In the top, in the, in the, in the, what you look down upon, are things that you could have at home. So it's the last letter home, it's the medals, it's the death plaque, it's the uh, uh, any souvenirs that were sent home, it's bits of his uniform. It's the things that if you're very lucky to commemorate that soldier, you may find in your attics or, 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 or in collections at home. So it's about memory and the memory that's held at home. What's below 
it's the memory that's held in the fields of the soldiers. So it's 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 the, the shovels, the spades, the, the boots, the bits that turn up every ploughing season. Now they don't turn up quite as regularly as they used to, but they still do. They still, I, go, I used to go walking with my son in the fields on the Somme. So this is the kind of stuff that my barn is full of bits and bobs like this. They were good. A bit of a collector like myself, and you just can't help yourself when you pick up a shovel or something, or a bit of remains of a pig, or a belt buckle, or whatever. And you think, oh, it's just moving to find it, so you take it, you take it home. So that's all all, all about about memory. What I just want to show you before I let you have a look at that is just kind of have a look at these pictures of the physical fighting here. So if you just follow me into the church that are pointed out here, we went along here. This is Fishhead Roundabout. We went along uh, this one down here, and we're now at Tynecourt Cemetery here. Now this is, uh, as you can see, you can see uh, into all most of the houses, you can see that they've lost their roofs, the church has lost its roof. Most of this has been damaged, and it was damaged in the fighting of 1915. So the fighting of 1915, when it came across here as the Germans forced us back, has caused that destruction. But what we can still see is you can see the field systems, you can see the roads, you can quite clearly see what's going on. What you're looking at here with all the track marks and everything are the Germans building the fortifications here. This is in the period when they're, they're finishing off the, for, the fortifications that are in the Tynecourt Cemetery. The physical fighting here is going on over there somewhere. You know, no man's land, that junction is right very close to Ypres, but as Third Ypres develops it's going to move this way. Within a month of it looking like this, when the fighting actually physically gets here, it's converted to. So this is exactly the same place. Where's the village gone? You know when I was saying you about the red yeah. stains in the mud? Now you understand that there really are red stains in the mud. <coughs> that village, even the remnants of it have gone. There is nothing but shell holes and craters. Most of the roads have disappeared. It's almost impossible to see anything that's left at all. This is a slightly higher resolution, so it's the plane is a little bit uh, lower. These are obviously photos that were taken by reconnaissance planes flying over here. And we can see it's just overlapping shell holes full of water. There's nothing else, nothing else there. Now what you have to think about is that has been happening all the way from Ypres, because the fighting starts just outside of Ypres. So if you look up this window to here, it's completely that. So now we start to understand why the woods will eventually get the fighting up to here. Because we've got to get our guns and everything and the infantry have got to get up here and they've got to cross a landscape. Just below that reef is commemorating the Australian 3rd Division. But the whole of this, uh, this, this whole reef is going to take by the 3rd Division. Where have you come from? So that's just behind that can now, uh, now that's a cemetery, um, and they're actually attacking from there. So that's where they're starting, and this is where they're finishing. They're doing their counter attack. Oh, yeah. So they go through those, carry on here, and up, up to here. Individual men all the time that are making the difference because they're driven to ground by guns fired through the apertures, killing all the all the crew, banishing the ones that are still alive, and then the rest of the men stand up and move forward. And then it's somebody else's turn to do the same for the next one. And they are they are moving forward by individual acts of bravery by individual men. And this this guy McGee, he's one of the guys who's going to do it. He's going to take the blockhouse that's in the farm uh, over there. But the sad thing is, for a lot of them, one thing that it was, they think, oh, that works, we'll do it again. And we'll do it again. And we'll do it again. And he did it three times, and the third time he was killed. Because he just, you, know, you look me all at once, but not three times, when you're the only guy standing up running forward. And, but it is, the movement does help. You know, being, being stuck and, and, and static is what kills you. Movement does help, and lots of guys realise this, and so you've got to keep everybody moving, and if it means doing an individual act of bravery, then, then you, you do. Sometimes they are the only awards you can get posthumously. In other words, all the other UCs, the MMs, the DCMs, the BSOs have to be won um, uh, and you have to be alive to win them. You cannot win them and be killed. So it's the lowest award and the highest award. Uh, He's from Newcastle. 
Um, he uh, is from a fairly fairly affluent family in Newcastle. Um, he's going to uh, be killed here. There's a, a, a very big report about him. We know a lot about him, mainly because he became missing. And if you become missing, people start to try and look for you. And in looking for you, they question your comrades. And the question of comrades, did you see what happened to Captain Jeffries? Over and over again, shot in the stomach, lying in the bottom of a shell hole, in terrible agony, and he was there for most of the day. And people passing over him reported seeing him. Eventually he dies there, and a comrade bur buries him, not from the same battalion, but somebody buried him, and he re also reported burying him and marking his grave. But by the time the war ends and the gathering of the graves, his grave is him, they can't find him. His father came all the way from Australia to come and help look for his body. You know, back to that people coming out looking for the bodies. So his father thought, no, I'm not accepting this, I'm going to come and try and find him. And he spent about six months here uh, working with the with the burial teams trying to identify uh, identify his son. He's actually on the boat going back to Australia when he was identified. The, uh, uh, they found him when he was on the boat, but at least they found him. Um, the service file kind of implies it doesn't really say, make it clear, but it looks like he may have come back. That in the in the in the late twenties he came back again to actually come and see his uh, his, son, his son's grave. Uh, acts of bravery, moving forward, keeping his men moving, uh, and, and taking an enemy position. Yeah. So uh, and, uh, uh, he was actually uh, again killed after the award in Victoria. Victoria. Right, but going to create a, a, a concentration temperature here. It went, well, it's really bizarre. It is, yeah. Well, it's it tells us. Right, the road.